Phil, I'd like to start by throwing some impressions at you. I've heard you describe as an enormously energetic film director, and somebody said to me that you direct films a bit like a cavalry charge. Does that mean anything to you? Um, oh, well, uh, I suppose it does in a way. Uh, which, which films? But, I mean, th different films have different styles. Your approach to directing, though, actually on a set yourself, is enormously energetic. You're here, there and everywhere. You're involved with everything. Um, the rest of the crew and cast have trouble keeping up with you. Uh, well, that's not always true. It depends what sort of film uh, you're talking about. I think um, you've only seen a, a couple of the films. Yeah. Um, so that... Uh, uh, one, I mean, the one film in particular, Backroads, which which you have seen, um, there was there was a deliberate attempt to made to achieve a certain pace, both in the dialogue, um, in the choreography of the movement of the actors, um, things like that. Um, obviously, you can't. Uh, I mean, different films in different scripts uh, need different approaches. Um, you find sometimes, for example. Um, and that's that's true. Say when we were shooting Newsfront, and we had a really, um, we had to, a, a day in a, in a in a lake to shoot a flood sequence, um, and so we needed to move from uh, from uh, from point A to point B very quickly, and also creating a huge holocaust at the same time. Um, it seemed as though uh, the sort of thing that we were trying to create, um, which was quite energetic needed an energetic vibe produced on the set. Um, and also, we just weren't getting, te technically, for technical reasons, we just weren't getting what we wanted. So I had to race from behind the camera to in front of the camera and take the actor and, you know, push him into the, into the stream and hold him back and, and all that sort of thing because um, otherwise we wouldn't have got all the shots done in the day. Well, that's probably what they mean by the cavalry charge approach, isn't it? Is that important to you, though? The mood you adopt, does that finally find its way onto the film? Um, yes, well, it, inevitably, you know, you, um, no matter, even if you're shooting someone else's script, um, this, is, this is why it's not true when you say, like, I mean, a lot of people say, for example, when an, when an American actor um, makes a film, say Jack Nicholson directs a film, they say, oh, yes, but it's so much easier, you know, and really it's not really him directing it, it's, it's um, just that he's got so much technical backup and um, that uh, the, his director of photography can choose the angles for him and everything like that. Um, and it's inevitable that, that the character or the mood of the director will find its way onto the screen. Um, it's unavoidable. Uh, All right, but what I'm getting at is you're not sort of standing back with an air of Olympian calm and saying, right, places, please, go, roll. Oh, yes, on, 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 in certain scenes, in certain scenes, uh, yes. Uh, but in other scenes, no. And also remember that um, up until this last film, uh, all the films that I made were made really cheaply, so there's no, uh, hardly any backup. <laughs> so really, you, you, you know, there's no propsman, and there's no grip, um, sometimes there's no lighting man. So you've, you've got to be all of those things as well as the producer yourself. And sweeping and the, director. the place out afterwards. <laughs> and sweeping the place out afterwards and waking everyone up in the morning and um, all that sort of stuff. The other suggestion I heard about you was that you've always been very democratic too in the way you go about making a film. Some directors will impose themselves on their actors and just issue orders. Uh, I've heard it say that, said that you discuss things with your actors, coax, plead, seek their opinions. True. Well, see, the thing is, um, <coughs> is this. Uh, what, I, I think that um, that film is an auto medium to a degree, but when you're making and 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 there's different films that are, that that lend themselves to the auteur theory of that that it's a product of one person male or female, who is the sort of film artist expressing themselves. And that's true to a more or less degree. But certainly when you're making a narrative feature film um, in a commercial context, that can't be true. Um, and I think that also that perhaps um, 
you're being foolish if you don't make the best use of all the uh, gathered minds that are there on the set. An example, say, to, to acting. Um, you can, you, you, obviously a director has his own ideas about the part and how he'd like it to be played. But when you're choosing an actor for a role, um, you don't just choose someone, or at least I don't, and follow the, the concept that you'll choose someone and then they'll, they will adapt themselves to the part. Really what you do is you choose someone that you know and recognise some aspect of their own personality which will lend itself to the part, which they'll bring to the part. Um, so, for example, in the case of um, Bill Hunter in, um, in Newsfront. Um, in Backroads. And in Backroads. Oh, so, yeah. um, uh, knowing Bill, um, I knew that he'd, have, he'd bring his own personality, his own vibe, his own way of expressing things to the part. And the idea that I always adopt is that, therefore, um, you should try and draw out from your, from your actor or from you, the technician that you're working with, with as much of their themselves as possible. And then finally, you've got to be an arbitrator. So you really are like sort of um, um, uh, a, the cha a chairman of a meeting. Um, that's the, the approach uh, I do take, you're right. Um, so you try and draw out all these individual personalities and their creativity, their, um, their approach to a scene, their approach to the whole movie. Um, but finally, of course, you can't, you'll never get any, anything done on a set if, if it's a continual um, conference. So finally, you've just got to say, and, and, uh, OK, we'll do it like that. Um, How often do you do that? How often do you say, OK, I've had it, you're doing it my way? Um, well, eventually, you, you do it um, all the time because uh, uh, ultimately there are so many, I mean, there will be so many conflicting approaches to, to a scene that um, ultimately you have to say that um, all the time. Um, so that you say, okay, here's the scene. We're, you're, you're, you're waiting here and there's a car going to come around the corner and you're, you've set up and you're going to film the car which you think is going to hit a bump. This is a thing that happened on, on, on Newsfront. Um, you, you think it's going to hit a bump. Now, just place yourselves where, how you think you'd, uh, you'd be placed. This is the first rehearsal. Just uh, go to where you think you, you, you'll go. Now, the idea behind that is, one, the two actors involved were Chris Haywood and Bill Hunter. They've done a lot of research, particularly Chris, into the way newsreel cameramen, this is talking about Newsfront, mm. the way newsreel cameramen operate, where they stand, their relationship as a, as a, a cameraman and his apprentice, his, his camera assistant, um, how they'd operate. And so we, we, we go through the first rehearsal. And Chris Haywood um, runs runs out uh, across, off the, off the set, uh, out of the camera view, picks up a little IMO, they're filming with, with an Ari, picks up an IMO, starts filming, and I said, oh, well, what are, you, what are you doing with the IMO, Chris? He said, well, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, you know, I'd, go, I'd try and get an extra shot for the governor. You know, I've been working here for five years, and I'm, I, can, I can take the IMO and I'll get an extra cutaway. I said, oh, well, of course, we, we, I hadn't even thought about that, and I... Uh, I said, oh, well, um, yes, you would. And we had about a 10-minute discussion, which actually got quite fiery, because Chris insisted he was sick of actually hanging around just being Bill Hunter's assistant. Um, uh, and eventually, we went my way, um, which was really because I had an overview. Um, but we went his way to a degree. He, he said that he, he would have run out and, and helped. The, what happened was they were waiting on a corner on the Red X trial in 1953, and they knew that this was a dangerous corner. Bruce Spence and Les Foxcroft are Red X trial drivers in a beat-up um, Volkswagen. They come around the corner and the car turns over by accident. And the two cameramen have got E on their face and feel quite embarrassed about the fact that they've knowingly waited uh, um, in this difficult location. Um, and Chris said, well, I, I'd run out and help them. Whereas in the script and the way I'd conceived it, they stayed there feeling quite ashamed and, and, and um, threw their apologies across to the, to the two drivers they got out of the car. Um, Did you get the final word? Oh yeah, I got the final word, but the final word was a compromise between what I wanted and how I'd conceived it, considering also that the actors uh, have, have probably in some ways a greater overview and in other ways a less <coughs> overview of their character than the director because considering say you've got ten major actors or ten major speaking parts in a film each of those actors has studied every individual scene and seen its relationship to every other scene that he's in 
so hopefully they've choreographed their prog the progression of their characters throughout the whole film. Um, well, that gets back to what we said, doesn't it, that you are a democratic film director in that sense? To a degree, yes, but um, I think that what you, what you gain out of that is that um, you'll get a far more realistic performance, um, and, I, and I always try and aim for um, not the sort of performance, I suppose, that we could call the ABC style, which is um, quite a stiff performance, a more or less theatrical uh, rendering of a character. In other words, a studied sort of uh, thing. I, I, I personally go for, and this also relates back to choosing the right people who are suited to the part, for, to, for a performance that comes out of some sort of inner emotion, and, and so that the people look as though they've done all that before and they actually mean what they're saying, rather than a mere um, uh, screen that they've set up around their body to make them appear like that. Um, you know, it's... Uh, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Does this happen then, because your early career started off making small mini documentaries where you weren't dealing with actors, you were dealing with real live people and you couldn't direct them to perform? Um, yeah, yeah, it does. It, it, comes out of, um, it comes out of an approach to documentary filmmaking and I suppose um, really this, this whole documentary background has has been quite a great influence on a lot of filmmakers in Australia. Say Donald Crombie, for example, is another one, um, uh, where he, he made films at Film Australia, documentaries, quite a lot of them observational documentaries, and the same thing happened to me, making observational films. Now, the first thing, the old approach to, the observa to, to a documentary, and the one which prevailed here in Australia, was based on the, on the English uh, concept um, that had been built up by the Grierson School, which was and which was which was a result really of, of the technological sort of advances that were available to filmmakers and that was one where in fact to create um, a reality of, of say a um, dock worker what you did was you didn't go out and just film him doing things um, uh, naturally and then bring them back and make it, make up the film out of that but rather you really got him to reenact what he did and you filmed it in carefully composed shots, uh, so that, example, you'd cut to a close-up at the right moment, in the same tradition as, as, a, as a narrative uh, um, film. Um, but you're when not I using started, an actor, are you? No, you're not using an yeah. actor, but nevertheless, you are, you, you, what the idea is you go out, you make up your mind of what the situation is, and then you get the real person to reenact it for you, and you choreograph it and, 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 and split, split your, uh, your sequences up into certain shots and close-ups. And now that was the old tradition that was dictated largely by the fact that um, uh, they had uh, immovable and, and large cameras. They didn't have um, portable sound uh, equipment. Um, then by the time I started making those documentaries in the late 60s, um, the whole revolution in portability had come in and now we had 16 millimeter lightweight cameras with shotgun microphones and you really could now be a fly on the wall. And there was a whole movement away, and this is still going on at Film Australia, where there's a, there, is, there is sort of a fight between the old and the new, the new guard of doc documentary filmmakers. There's a whole movement away from this imposed reality towards a much more observational uh, style you of you filmmaking. You mean simply filming what happened? Filming what happened. Um, not I mean, if it doesn't happen the way you liked it, well, that's too bad. That's, that's too bad. Happened. I mean, in other words, um, you're, 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 genuine, you're reacting in a genuine way to, to what's going on. You're recording and then you editorialise later in the editing by manipulation, by juxtaposition. You make your statements later, but at least the basic material that you've got there is, for want of a, a better word, true, verite, uh, cinema yes. verite. Um, then you editorialise later. All right, um, small, small film you did. Now, but, but just to make that point, that, that is the tradition that I came out of that sort of um, uh, the idea where you let people be themselves and you almost observe them like a fly on the wall. And so that whole sort of um, approach um, uh, really is what I've tried to bring to um, dramatic films as well. And it's also um, because in seeing a lot of uh, dramatic films and documentaries, I was really dissatisfied with, with, with the... Um, with the artificiality of them. Staginess. Yes, the staginess. Yeah. Um, Can we get to a yes. little film you made called, um, or was it Why Can't They Be Like We Were? Mick. 
Yeah. Mm. The kid with the tattoos, yeah, the, yeah. the little bodgy, whatever he was from yeah, the yeah. western suburbs, which is what, 10 minutes long? 10, yeah. yeah. Is that what you did there? Did you just set up a camera and let him walk back and forwards in front of it and um, not seek to direct him? Yes. Um, so there's different styles in that film. That, that, that was part of a series um, of which I made three, which was for cl uh, classroom discussion to be used in a project called the SEMP, SEMP project, Social Education Materials Project, which is, um, which is they're sort of like textbook source material um, to raise discussion in classrooms. And, and the whole, uh, um, there was a whole series made about adolescence about growing yeah. up. Well, how did you go um, about that? You had this body. Well, yeah, as I was saying, there's yeah. different, there's different, um, there's different um, styles there. One, and th this is largely dictated by the final product that you're trying to achieve. And that, so that's not, a, that's not really a true expression of how I would have liked to have done that film, because that film was made for a sponsor for Film Australia, who in turn were producing it for a classroom situation. We were making it with educational advisors. So there were certain things that we had to that we had to achieve, certain educational points that we had to make, a certain construction that we had to adopt. Um, uh, that film ranges from pure observation when the when the at the end there's a sequence where the kids are in their in their FJ um, or FX Holden um, driving off from Penrith into the city and they're going on what they call a poofta bashing um, expedition, which is really a, um, you know, uh, they entice homosexuals into um, into yeah. <laughs> situations and, and, and bash them up, um, which is sort of... Uh, was uh, that contrived, though? No, no, that was totally uncontrived. Except um, in the sense of shooting that, you're going to have to get um, cutaways, POVs, uh, you're going to have to light the car, no, light well, coming out the door. Uh, what we did was this. I mean, there's no such thing as cinema verite, let's face it, unless... The people in the film, I mean, there is cinema verite of a thing like a meeting or um, a situation that's so explosive that the, the people that you're filming totally forget that the camera's there. Right. And I mean, so they do, uh, right, something like that. That does happen. They just don't notice that you melt into the background. But I mean, there's no such thing really as the, like, the, um, say, a film like um, A Married Couple, Alan King's film, where he studied this married couple live with them in their house for six months, and you're asked to believe that this is a genuine. Um, uh, representation and the same thing with the American family, they did a series on the English family, oh. a genuine uh, representation of their day to day life. It's not really true because, it, but what it is true is that it is a genuine representation of their day to day life plus their relationship with the camera crew. Yeah. Now, um, there's, there's more or less degrees of cinema verite. Finally, in that film, we achieved what, what came closest to truth on film. Um, the crew, we'd been working with them for a week on and off and the, the kids sort of got to know us, trust us and we adopted the same larrikin behaviour as them, not inciting them to any, any to a degree, but um, and we tried to melt in with them. It was a three-man crew, just a cameraman, um, a sound recordist um, and, and myself with one light. Um, and and you, we tried to set up a context where they would behave naturally Having observed them on previous weeks, um, I knew that they were being quite natural. Um, they were changing their behaviour to a degree for the camera. So it was in fact you that had to change to get their confidence? Yes, yes, we had to change and actually sort of, um, um, you know... Bash a few poofters. Well, no, no, we didn't go that far. <laughs> um, but we couldn't be seen to be condemning them. Yeah. But we also couldn't for ethical reasons be seen to be inciting them, saying, come on, let's go. We had to really wait around until midnight until they decided they'd leave their skating ring and, and go out, go into the city on, on, on a sortie. Um, All right. But th that, as I was saying, but just to finish that point, that film varies from set up interviews, there's a core interview with the boy and with, the, um, with his parents, to more or less observational material where he's being tattooed, right through to the other extreme of um, of, um, of not genuine observation, but as close to it as possible when the boys are observed interrelating with each other in the car. Which takes us then very neatly to back roads, because I suspect you use much the same approach there. There's some parts of back roads which are obviously very highly sculpted and took a long while to set up. There are other parts, say, where you're dealing with Aborigines in their reserve, <coughs> where you obviously can't push them around and direct them, and you are just shooting what happened. Mm. True? Is that right? Yes, right? yes. Um, see, uh, that film 
uh, that film went through a, a genesis that continued right through until it hit the screen. Um, and Let's even then afterwards it was recut. What were you trying to achieve there when you set out? Um, well, originally, the original motivation to make the film came from a short story written by a guy in South Australia called John Emery, which was about a, um, a young guy called Noel, um, who later became Gary in the film. Um, Gary Foley. The Gary original. Foley, yeah. Who, who, um, who, to me, in some ways, the, 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 the portrait of this guy that, um, that, that John had, had written, in some ways, uh, uh, was uh, very typical of Aborigines that I, uh, I had observed. That is, that they had reached that degree of apathy due to uh, continually being told that, that there was no use striking out. They had to accept things, and I mean, and that's sort of, ba it's also a <coughs> basic sort of inherent um, response within, within Aborigines. Um, he'd ad achieved such a degree of apathy that he was willing to be pushed around by whites all around him um, until finally he does, right at the end of that story, do something. He strikes out and, re and refuses to, to be kicked around any longer. That was sort of the germ of the, of the, uh, of the film. Um, then he wrote a screenplay and then I rewrote his screenplay. Then I was looking around for someone to play this guy and, and um, I hit on the idea of Gary Foley. So I approached Gary, showed him the script, and he felt that, and the, one of my original motivations in writing the script was not that his aboriginality was so important as it turned out to be later, but really that it was an examination of so-called unmotivated crime. Um, but it did turn out to be an aboriginal picture in the sense it, that... <coughs> well, it always was, but the ab aboriginality aspect, the fact that he was an aboriginal was not so important in the original script, not so important as it turned out to be. Um, <coughs> anyway, Gary... Um, what I was trying to do with Gary was, okay, I could see that he was a volatile, um, um, articulate ab young Aboriginal. And what I said to him to, was this. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to, you come from the Northern Rivers area. I will call this guy Gary. What I want you to do is to adopt his background in other words, uh, sorry, adopt, make him, allow him to adopt your background. In other words, everything that happened to you as a kid happened to this character in the film. So you're blending documentary and acting. Yeah. Everything that happened to you as a kid happened. Every experience that you've had a, as an Aboriginal um, in a white society is his background. So I don't want you to, to change any of that. All I want you to do now is take, take yourself uh, and, and imagine that you didn't come to the city in the early 70s, that you stayed in the country. Um, and you're living on a reserve. In other words, he had to take his background to a certain degree, um, say that you're living on a reserve, um, and these fictional things happen to you. Oh. That is, the things in the story. Now I want you, now I want you to, now, and then I said, now we, we've got um, 15 sequences here, 15 things that happen to you. What you've got to do is take your real background Blend it, take it up to that point, adopt this guy's background as well, that is that he stayed on a reserve in Burke, and now in these sequences that we're going to do in the film, I want you to um, read the script, see whether you agree with the way that he'd express himself, and change it if you want to. And that so that's what happened. That gets back to Philip Noyce, democratic filmmaker, doesn't it? Um, well, to a degree, but also it gets back to the uh, idea that... Um, that whites can't make films about blacks because they don't really understand, uh, you know, I mean, it's not only that. I mean, there, it's really a case of inviting him to be the scriptwriter and, and admitting that he knows more about Aborigines than I ever will. Technical advisor. Uh, well, more than that. Oh. More than that. Um, How deeply did you want to make a picture about Aborigines, land rights? Um, well, not as, not as deeply as the, as the final film comes out, Originally, although I agree with everything that's said in the film. Um, so what, you started off with a road picture and it turned out to be a political statement. Started off with a road statement. picture that, 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 that more or less swung on the fact that, that the central character was an Aboriginal um, and then allowed Gary to take that, that basic concept and develop it himself in conjunction with the other actors in the picture 
um, remembering that we were out on the road. It wasn't, we had a small crew of six people. We were out on the road, travelling and living in caravans and, and on farms and things like that. So we were able to set up a sort of a workshop atmosphere and that was um, the first line of the script says, this script is not a final script. The shooting will be a workshop. We'll change all the dialogue if we have to. Um, we'll incorporate things that happened to us at the time. Um, um, that was the idea. The same thing happened with Bill Hunter and the part of, um, of, uh, of Jack. Um, it so happened that uh, Bill has bummed around the country with, with Aboriginals, um, has had quite a close but conflicting relationship with Australian blacks. Um, I said, here's the character of Jack. Um, this is what I think about him. Now show me what you can do. Um, so some scenes we stuck directly to the script, obviously f because structurally they had to advance the narrative in a certain way. Other scenes we would discuss before shooting and they'd say, listen, we, don't, we think your, your dialogue's rubbish. You, know, you don't know how to write dialogue. Now this. see, at that point, some directors would have said, hell, I'm the director, you'll damn well do as you're told. Um, I could name a dozen Australian directors that would do that. You yeah, don't. but, but um, quite often they were right, you see. So... Uh, you can't argue if you're wrong. <laughs> True. Uh, yeah, they'd say, well, the, your, your dialogue's rubbish, we're going to change it. So they'd, I'd say, well, show me what you've got in mind. And they'd do this and I'd say, oh, look, you know, that's a bit heavy-handed. And there's still things in it that, I, that, that, um, that uh, if we were writing a script, that we, we, I wouldn't have, I would have said, no, no, we can't have that. Other times, like in one scene in particular, <coughs> I said, okay, now this is where you guys, we knew it was always in the script, in this scene, they, the two of them reached some understanding of each other, the, the, the white of the black, the black of the white. And they said, yeah, well, look, we've been talking about this, they've been living to together for th three weeks, we've been talking about this scene and we reckon we know how to do it and we reckon that we've had enough discussions now out here just to play this scene right through. And it's a great, it's a scene w which, um, where the camera was strapped to the side of the, um, of, the, uh, of the car and there's a two shot looking over Bill Hunter towards Gary and they're arguing with each other about, about the black situation and Bill's coming up with stereotype white responses to the dirty blacks and their attitudes and Gary's trying to answer him. Um, uh, and that scene was just filmed almost like, a, like you would a documentary. The camera is, has a 400 feet, 11 minutes of film in it. Uh, Bill Hunter's driving the car. I'm sitting in the back. The sound recorder's in the boot. Um, and away we went. And away we went. Off they went. And they, and, but, I mean, you still are the director because um, then the choice comes later of what material to use. So you actually, you, you're still sculpting all that material that you've, you've gathered later on. You're sculpting it into some statement. Um, but you are making use of the energy, the enthusiasm, the passion of your actors. You've now, pardon the phrase, hit, hit the big time with the news front, if you like, in the sense that, as opposed to back roads, where every second word was fuck this or something like that, you're now going for a totally commercial thing with the mm. news front, aren't you? Where the mum and dad from Rockdale can bring the kids to see it. Mm. Big change? Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The thing is um, that uh, you couldn't, you couldn't adopt the same approach anyway. For a start, that that's, that's what film, I mean. The film set in, but quite apart from whether you could, whether the commerciality of the film is at stake, yeah. you can't, you couldn't take um, an actor in 1978 and expect him to play a role of a of a cine cameraman in 1948. No, I'm not, bring... asking, I'm not asking is the film changing, I'm asking are you changing? Oh, I see. No, no, not really, because um, when you see um, Newsfront, you'll see that it's, um, it's probably more revolutionary than Backroads, more so. How do you mean revolutionary? Well, revolutionary in structure, um, in the things that it's saying. It's just that, um, that, that uh, fortunately, the film, the, 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 um, revolutionary aspects of both the structure, the characters, um, uh, and what happens in the film are tempered or watered down by, and made more accessible to a general audience. Um, but I think that um, uh, the f that Newsfront uh, 
doesn't uh, pull a, pull back on its punches uh, or, no, I'm or not its saying statements that. or anything like that. I'm not saying that, but you can't adopt this loose structured approach, can you? The actors have got to be word for word up and down yes. the script. Yeah, oh yeah, script. I agree with that. Yeah. But then, then I'm saying that, that that's what, how the first question, uh, the first answer I gave you, which was that th these characters are in in the past. You can't take someone in 1978 and expect him to to bring as much of his own personality to a character who is a, one, a technician, because he's got to then therefore learn a special sort of vocabulary, he's got to have a special way of walking, he's got to um, have a special way of relating to a machine and everything like that. And so in other words, there's a greater degree of artificiality involved and also they're talking in language that is not um, modern day colloquial language, they're talking in 1948. Sure. Um, so you're imposing much more control on this picture than you would have, say, on back roads? Uh, on the direction of your act or something? Yeah, oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Was that hard to do after the loose structured thing in back roads? Uh, no, 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 not really. Um, you see, it's just that we were more word perfect in this film, but it doesn't mean that we were choreography perfect or that we were emotionally um, true to the script, you see. Um, we had to be word perfect because the language has been worked out. You can't say, uh, for example, you couldn't say, um, uh, you know, uh, what's, a, what's a modern day term that means great stuff? Um, I mean, ripper beauty, you know. Yeah, ripper yeah. beauty and, you wouldn't have that in the you know, things shop. like that. Um, so you had to be careful with the script. So we were more or less word perfect to the script. But that doesn't mean that, that the actors didn't bring their own personalities to a more or less degree to, to the part, or that we didn't change the choreography, where they walked, how they do that. Oh, look, I wouldn't do that like that. Come on, I mean, really, and he, she wouldn't react like that. that that's not right. Mm. Uh, so that's, that we still did that. Um, do you feel that the news front, as an attempt at a commercial picture, is um, a logical progression for you? Oh, yeah, well, it is um, because, uh, yeah, it is. So I made a film at Film Australia um, in 1975 called God Knows Why, but it works. That was um, about uh, Arch Dr. Archie Calicarinus of vitamin C, a doctor who believed that vitamin C was the answer to many uh, um, medical problems, particularly uh, that, it, that it would be of great help in, in overcoming the so-called uh, Cot death syndrome in Aboriginal kids. He discovered yeah. that in Colorinabri, um, a certain number of kids, Aboriginal kids, were dying um, in their cots for no apparent reason. Um, over a period of years, he experimented and found that by injecting massive doses of vitamin C, within half an hour, these kids that that previously were in the, in the last stages of, of dying, recovered fully. Yeah. And he worked out that it was because they, they were, uh, were massively deficient in vitamin C. Anyway, this film used um, um, newsreel material from ABC Four Corners and This Day Tonight, um, reconstructed, mixed in with um, reenacted material with an actor playing him, plus documentary material shot in 1975 of, of that man into the one story. Mm. And so in that way, the, the news front, and, and that wasn't Which my... doing much the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Both of those um, films weren't my original ideas. That, that film was Dick Mason, the producer's ideas, idea, the one for, called God Knows Why, but it works. And this one was um, David Elphick, the producer's idea. Um, but it was up to me to sort of uh, take that basic concept and, and, and produce the final film. But yeah, but from making... Uh short films which are aimed at a specific target, as that one was. God knows why, but it works. Yeah. Um, oh, well, it wasn't, actually. It was made for television. It was sold to Channel 7. They'll never show it, I don't think, but uh, they, they paid quite a lot for it. Yeah, <laughs> but what I mean is you're now getting onto the big, great silver screen out into the suburban Roxies and so on with news front, aren't you? Is that a logical progression? Well, you always... Uh, you don't make... I mean, it's sort of... Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, you don't make films uh, for your friends only. <laughs> you're not yeah. trying to... Um, preach to the converted or anything, or sort of, uh, you know... Why do you make them? Um, well, that's, that's a hard question that I was um, just thinking about the other day. Um, see, when I, when I started making films, it was... Um, and it still is a privilege. It's not, it's not a job. Uh, but it's a very complicated question, which is all tied up with, a, with 
with many things, such as the whole Protestant work ethic and, and the, the will to succeed and, and things like that. Um, and that comes into it. Um, but you but, could also be an accountant on that basis. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. But I mean, or originally I started making uh, films when I was at school, and it was um, it was a real privilege. You know, you sold uh, ten dollar shares, and um, and got five hundred dollars and made a film, and and you were really privileged that you could do that and, and express yourself. Um, it seems. So you really are a capitalist, aren't you? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> they never made any money. Oh, right. <laughs> you fail capitalists. No, well, it's, uh, it's the same, uh, see, uh, this sounds pretentious, but it, uh, see, a filmmaker is really an artist. It's just that, um, or he's a poet or a, a writer, it's just that um, it's so much more expensive to express yourself on film. You've, you've got to have, even to make the simplest statement, you've got to have a, have a fair amount of money. Um, so you're not really a capitalist. I mean, the idea of selling shares was to raise the minimum budget in 1967 of $500 to make a 10-minute film. You still haven't said why you make them, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I tell myself that it's, um, that it's because I just want to get things out. I want to keep on um, expressing or creating or something like that. Um, How old are you now? 28. Where do you want to be when you're 58? Uh, where I'd like to be when I'm 78 is in, in the old men's home with, um, with a whole lot of films that I've made that, that uh, are diaries of my reactions over every year of my life. And I'm going to sit back there and just look at them and just have a wonderful time and, and just because I'll have this living um, diary of, of a, a lifetime's work, hopefully, that, and every little piece of it will be a piece of me, but it'll also be a record of, like a, a written diary, of some relationship that I've had with someone or um, a reaction I've had to material or to events. And is I'll just sit there and watch it year after year and I'll have a great time. Is the film industry <laughs> going to let you do that? Uh, is this industry going to last long enough and going to be yeah, big enough? Yeah, but it all it? depends what you call an industry, you see. You can all, you can, as I say, if the, if the so-called feature film industry evaporates, as it's, uh, as it's uh, showing signs that it may do for various reasons, um, you can, I can scratch, for, uh, scratch uh, a piece of um, uh, black, uh, black film and, and colour it in with texture colour. Um, you know, and I'll still be happy. Because <laughs> uh, you can make some great films that way for, for ten dollars for ten minutes. Um, just by, uh, you know, drawing on, on clear film and, and, and then colouring it in. So if, if the present boom for, for nostalgia pictures, Caddy, The Irishman, Picnic at Hanging Rock, collapses, and we don't go anywhere beyond that. We never start producing anything contemporary. Mm. You'd be quite happy to do that, would you? Well, that's not the reason why it'll, it'll evaporate with, if we don't do that. Yeah, I'll be quite happy to do that. But um, what is the reason? I'll go to work at Film Australia and, and um, content myself with a certain type of film and developing in more specialised ways, like making, uh, refining the eight-minute short film to, to the nth degree, and, and each time convincing myself I'm progressing and and, and mm -hmm. refining it and and you know, and, and, and churning the film style and structure around and, and throwing it out and trying to throw up new ideas and I'll be happy. Why do you think the industry might evaporate? Well, it's, um, it's because of this. Uh, see, we, we, so far, the film that's cost the most that's returned its, in, its, its money is uh, about 480 thousand dollars picnic at Hanging Rock. Admittedly, it could have cost a million dollars and it still would have returned its money. But in fact, um, there's probably more failures than successes. What's happening now is that just to make a feature film, it's costing the, the lowest possible budget that you, that you can mount a film with is rising all the time. But at the same time, there's, there's a greater uh, degree of specialization of, of uh, um, uh, th there's more blockbusters being made overseas, Close Encounters of the Third t Kind, Star Wars, even the small pictures are costing several million dollars. Um, and it it's really is becoming a case, say, uh, and, and a film like The Last Wave perfectly illustrates this, well-made, 
Sure, there's a couple of holes in the narrative. The ending maybe isn't quite satisfactory, but at least as well made as the majority of the overseas product that we get here. Starts off really well, well promoted, but it just dies. Why? Because it's got Star Wars next door and then the other side of Midnight and, and Close Encounters and that it's competing with. Now, what we've got to do, the answer therefore is, do we make films for $2 million and try and compete in the same way? And it seems that if we want to do that, we've got to prostitute ourselves to a so-called transatlantic, mid-Atlantic or worldwide type film, which doesn't have as its, as its roots a parochial sort of approach. You see, and, and critics of, of films that are peculiar Australian are always saying this, why don't we make international pictures? But do the Americans make international pictures? They make films which, in which people speak in their, in their dialects. They, 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 they make films about Californians. They make films about the Bronx Americans. They make films about uh, people in New Orleans. Um, and they, they, um, those films would be ridiculous if they had uh, so-called the inter international stars in them who spoke this sort of mid mid uh, accent. Corner, yeah. um, uh, so this is the problem. So if we're going to, we either make these sort of uh, films which are set nowhere, set in Australia, but only by accident, they could be anywhere. Um, and we can attempt to do that, but then we can't, we haven't got the, the uh, we can't, we won't necessarily be able to mount that many of those sort of films, or we can continue to try and make low budget pictures, right, which but good regain their, their income predominantly on the Australian market because they're about Australian themes, but what's happening there is that the, that the whole share of the market is evaporating. There's less people going to the movies than there used to be, and, and we're trying to compete against these few giant colossal movies um, and obviously we're coming off pretty badly. Um, and you're worried that'll continue then? Aren't you? Well, it, it will. It will. Unless, you know, we're, we're unless we can get Trevor Howard and, and Rod Taylor to come out and start. Well, I wonder whether they'll make any difference, you know. Um, I wonder. Um, the, answer, the answer seems to be that we have to, we have to go two ways. We can't make these mid-films mid that are either that are sort of like, um, at the moment, you'd say $800,000, The Mango Tree, The Irishman, it, that sort of um, are set in Australia and are peculiarly Australian, but try and be international in production standards. It seems that we've got to go all the way, that is, into the several million dollars like Jimmy Blacksmith, um, uncompromising about the way we shoot them, because the Australian film style has evolved um, as a result of, of film economics. Um, for example, the way in which uh, our, the cutting pace is really, sure, it's a true reflection of Australian, of the slower Australian pace compared to an American film, but there's also a very simple technical uh, reason for, for the slower cutting pace of, say, a film like Caddy or, or uh, P um, Picnic or even um, Sunday Too Far Away. And that really is simply that uh, we shoot for six weeks instead of 11. Um, if you've got a scene lasting three minutes, you'll only have a certain number of shots in it. Yeah. Um, instead of a, an American film shooting for 11 weeks, which has a greater, num a greater degree of coverage and a, therefore more manipulation filmically. Um, anyway, that's uh, off yeah. the point. No, um, right. I forget what the point is. but uh, <clears throat> The evaporation of the film industry. Yeah. So, so we either make, you think, big formula things like Airport and Jaws. No, no, not formula no. things, but they'll have, to be, they'll have to be something special about them, obviously. I mean, you, yeah. if, once you get into that area, you, you, there's got to be some, it's got to have some... Uh, something to hang itself on, you know, it's got to be special in some way, you know what I mean? Um, what, sort of conceivably like a modern version of the Sundowner, perhaps? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 if I had all the answers, I'd be out there making them um, <laughs> to, to exactly what we should do. No, I'd say that uh, maybe the Sundowner was one that should be made cheaply. I mean, we, we'll, we'll probably end up making, um, you know, films about 400,000. See, the, con the whole idea that we've been operating on up to Jimmy Blacksmith is this and um, Eliza Fraser is this. You make a film for, you, you've got to make four times the amount back, roughly, at the box office in order to pay for your negative costs, cost of producing your picture. And um, it can be expected that you'll make, uh, that say Picnic made 6.8 and Caddy made something like 4 million. It can be expected that you'll probably, if you do well, make uh, 2.5 million. So based on that, you can see you shouldn't be making a film for above 500,000. So if you do well, you'll make 2.5 million. And it really is as simple as that. If you do well, that's a good film that la to make 2.5 million locally will last for um, eight months, nine months. That's a long time. So if, if it all blows up in your face, 
Will you still be quite happy? Well, it won't to, blow up in my face. <laughs> if, you, if that industry blows up, will you still yeah. be quite happy to turn 100 feet of 16 mil through a camera and then sit back and look at it? Yeah, but I, I, home? In fact, I, I won't do that because you, um, you, know, you, you, you can make quite sophisticated films. When I said that I'd be happy to scratch film, I think I'd be a bit sad if I did do that. I probably will end up there, there anyway, when we probably all will. Um, but uh, um, but uh, you can make quite sophisticated statements for as little as $10,000 or $20,000, um, where you'll work on your idea for... Um, for example, you can work, you can work uh, at, at Film Australia and finance your own films just out of the pay you receive there. If you're paid 17000 you can live on seven and make a $10,000 half-hour film every year of your life. If you... So it won't be so bad in the men's home after all, will it? <laughs> <laughs> Philip, thanks very much for talking to us. Okay, thanks.